Hi, everyone, and welcome back to uh, Learn Julia with us. This is our fourth workshop in this series. And today we're going to be talking about number types. So we have uh, a document prepared here. It's on the Julia Gender Inclusive GitHub repo in the repository Learn Julia, and it's called Number Types. And we're going to be working in a Pluto notebook today, as we have been in the past few uh, workshops. So just as a little reminder, to get started with this, you um, first run using Pluto to activate the Pluto library. And then you have Pluto.run. And you can either leave these parentheses blank, or you can copy this whole code, uh, whether it doesn't make much difference. OK, so then when you get to Pluto, you'll have the option to put in a link and you can put in the link, you can load right from this um, GitHub link from our repository. So once you've done that, you should see our, our document. Um, as I said, we're gonna be talking about number types today. I wanna do a quick little recap of what we did last time. So in, in workshop three, we worked on strings and a lot of different things you can do uh, with strings in Julia. And as a reminder, strings are kind of like text. So they are um, any sort of text. So last time we heard that uh, how to do string concatenation in Julia. And concatenation connects multiple strings and kind of fuses them into one string or multiple characters. So for example, we have here, um, you can ignore the begin end block. This is a convention of Pluto where you can only have one unit of code in each code block. So to make these three lines into one unit, we start with a begin and end. But the main idea here is we can make two variables. So again, we assign variables with the equal sign and we have one here called fave food and one called favorite guest. And if we fill these in, so let's see, um, like my favorite food is pumpkin pie. So if I fill in my favorite food is pumpkin pie and my favorite guest is of course, um, Julia. Julia, uh, my co-teacher here, not <laughs> Julia the language. Then we can use these variables um, and fuse them into one long string by combining multiple strings and variable names using the asterisk operator. So the asterisk works as the concatenation operator in Julia. So if we run this, we'll see that um, these will all get put together into one string. So you can see the quotes start here and the end here. And now we have a long string that says, it's always nice to enjoy pumpkin pie with Julia. Okay, so the stars, or sorry, the asterisk is what concatenated those strings into one longer string. Something else we saw last time was string escape sequences. So there are certain characters that you're not allowed to use within strings in Julia, usually because they have a different function. So one of those is a dollar sign, you'll see why in a minute. And another one is the double quotes because the quotes as we know are the string delimiters, which means they show the beginning and the end of a string. So if you tried to put quotes in the middle of a string that would not work for Julia. But you can still do that. You just have to make sure to proceed them by a backslash. And here the backslash is called the um, escape sequence. Oops, I just thought to make this a little bigger. So you can proceed them by a backslash or you have to proceed them by a backslash. And there's other escape sequences we saw like backslash N will put a new line in the middle of your string and backslash T will put a tab indent in your string. So for an example, we have here, we wrapped it in text so that Pluto knows to display it as its text and not um, as the code. So we have the text here, one string, and we have this is backslash n, a multiplying quote, backslash n that contains quotation marks. When we run this, you'll see that it is indeed a multi-line quote. So the backslash n translate to um, line breaks or, or kind of like pressing the enter key. And these quotation marks, we didn't want them to break the string or mean, we didn't want to mean that this is the end of one string and this is the beginning of another string. So we preceded them with the backslash and now Julia knows that we actually want to display the, the quotes. Okay, so that's all you have to remember with kind of strange characters or characters that have another meaning is you proceed them by a backslash and uh, then you can 
um, include them in your string. Uh, the last thing we saw or what that about strings was string interpolation. An interpolation allows you to include variables that are stored, or sorry, values that are stored in a variable, and they don't have to be exactly available yet using the dollar sign operator. So that's why you can't use a dollar sign within a quote, sorry, within a, a string is because it, it's used for string interpolation to special string um, function. So here, if I have the variable favorite number and it's set to a value of 12, and I have my favorite food uh, variable, which I have already defined earlier, then we have here, um, I want to eat, and then we have string interpolation. So we have the interpolation character operator here of um, the dollar sign, and then we can call this variable and also do things to it. So we can call favorite number and also multiply it by two. All right, so that's a uh, string interpolation with the dollar sign. And another thing we saw was arrays. They contain multiple items. They don't have to be the same type, but they're wrapped in square brackets. So I'm gonna make one here called grocery list. That includes some of my favorite groceries like tofu, asparagus, and oat milk. And then you can index into anything that is a container. So an array is considered a container and it contains things like strings, but it can also contain numbers or a mix of strings and numbers. Uh, but a string is also a container because a string contains multiple characters. So the string oat milk, for example, contains the character O and A and T and so on. So anytime you have a container, you can pull a single item out of the container by using these square brackets and giving index value. So if I pull the first item from my grocery list, that will return tofu. And if I call it, have a really long string, like, hey folks, I hope you're enjoying Julia, then I can also pull out a certain character there by indexing into that string. So here I would, 35th character is this capital J, Julia. And finally, so just to end our little recap here, an array comprehension we saw, this is a loop that iterates over a container it creates an array and it can do an operation to each element in that container. So the syntax conceptually is kind of like new array is equal to um, square brackets, doing an operation to an item for item in container. And the types of operations you can do to each item is determined by the type of the item. So for example, the uh, grocery list array had all sorts of strings in it. And we know we can turn strings to uppercase using the uppercase function. So I made here um, a, an array called excited groceries where I just took everything from my grocery list and turned it into uppercase. So then I have uh, these three items again in uppercase. Okay, so that's a recap and now we'll move on to number types. So this is based on um, the Julia for Nervous Beginners course. They have a couple of videos about numbers, but particularly the one called number types, which I've linked here. And according to um, this course or to the Julia of Nervous Beginners course, they give two good reasons why you should learn number types and focus on them um, early on in your Julia journey. One is that there's a lot of error messages that can mention number types. And this might throw you off if you don't know like what um, they're referring to, or you don't realize it's actually just telling you about the numbers. And it also serves as a little introduction to the Julia type system. So we're just going to get lightly into that today. It's something that we'll continue to come back to. But for all the stuff about types, uh, you should know that you don't usually have to specify what type your input should be or your value should be. Julia is going to select the best option most of the time. So you don't have to initiate like a variable or um, by always giving like a type that was set to it. What's the duck type? Um, but when you start writing functions, which I think we'll do in, a, in an upcoming class or workshop, you sometimes need to provide different um, methods based on the type. So it's good to know what the types are underlying all of these operations. So what has a type anyway? 
Um, values have types, variables do not have types. Variables are just containers. So here, if I initiate this variable um, with a value of three, then you can see that this variable contains a number, right? But I can also then change that to um, some text. And now this variable has a type of a string. So it doesn't matter what you give to the um, variable, it can contain uh, values of all different types, but values have types. And we're going to focus on number types just because it's um, a good way to get into some of the most fundamental types in Julia. Okay, so first of all, how does Julia store a number? Uh, under the hood, all numbers are stored as zeros and ones. And depending on the way that you save your number, there may be more or less of these zeros and ones. And these zeros and ones are called bits. And all numbers, integers, fractions are subsumed under the abstract type of number. So there is a type in Julia called number that's very broad, but it contains concrete types like floats and integers, which are kind of like subtypes or they're the more, it's, that's a concrete layer. So we're gonna, there's two that are really common. That's what we're gonna focus on. That's int64 and float64. So int64 stands for integers and they're stored as 64 bits. So first of all, importantly, um, integers, that means there can't be a decimal point, right? There can't be fractions, it has to be a whole number. And sort of 64 bits, uh, let's like have a, <laughs> an exact example here. So let's look at, we have the number one, I've wrapped it in int64 just to make sure, to be 100% sure that Julia is interpreting it as an integer of type int64. And then I can call bit string on it, and it's going to actually show me what is going on under the hood for this integer. So you can see it's like all, it's like 63 zeros and then a one. So it's kind of a binary representation of the number one. If we um, try it, or two, you see it's like 62 zeros and then one zero. Um, three is one one. Four is one zero zero. So this is, if you've ever encountered binary before, this is kind of what's going on here. And int 64 can go up to a very large number, um, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but you can put very large numbers in here and it's gonna be able to, um, to store that in 64 bits on your PC. So that's what integers look like behind the scenes. What you need to know when you're using them is that they're whole numbers. And 64 is kind of the default number of bits that, that an integer is stored on. A very similar um, type is the float, similar in that it also is stored as 64 bits. But this can look a little different just in terms of how Julia kind of stores these. So if we look at the number one as a float. So it would be kind of like 1.0. You can see that, um, so let's also look at one, that this looks pretty different, right? So now we have like the, the ones up here in the front. We can also do decimals and they're gonna be stored also as 64 bits, but it's not in a way that's directly comparable here. So there's also all zeros and ones, but um, let's try like 186. But there's not a way to directly add these up because the, here the zeros and ones can only stand for integers and here they can stand for any, any number, including fractions. So perhaps the easiest comparison is to look at the ones. So you can see that as an integer, the one is stored as like three zeros and a one, but as a string, it's, it's stored differently. Okay, but basically what you need to know is that whole numbers can either be integers or floats because floats can be any number and integer like any real number and an integer can only be a whole number. And any arithmetic between an integer and a float will result in a float because they, um, an integer can be a float but a float can be an integer. So here, if we try five minus 2.5, and we save the result to this variable called result. And then we look at what type is this result. It's going to be a float. 
which is not going to be the case if you use integers. Okay, all this is to say that if you see something in the error messages that says uh, int 64 or float 64, what you know is that it's referring to a number. And it's either trying to say that it's an integer or it's stored as a non integer or something that can contain a fraction. Some other things you might see in working with numbers in Julia, you can get this NAN that stands for not a number. That's some sort of undefined or unrepresentable result. So if we try to do zero divided by zero in Julia, Julia is going to tell us that's not a number. So there's no number that Julia can conceive of that would make sense for this operation. Similarly, you might see INF, which would mean infinity. And for very big numbers that are not infinity, um, you may see that they're represented in scientific notation. So if we uh, run this here, we're 9.5 to the power of 300. So it's a huge number. And this is the output. And you notice there's like an E in here. There's always gonna be like an E and the E means this is the exponent that is given to a 10 and then multiplied by the rest of the number. So this whole number comes first and then it's multiplied by 10 with 293 zeros after it. This is um, scientific notation. So again, you would interpret it as this whole number before the E, this, this entire number before the E times 10 raised to the power of whatever comes after the e. So that's the exponent value. So that's what will happen when the number is very, very big because it can't really easily be printed. So if it's a, if it's a bit smaller, then it's going to be able to fit. But see here, if I do it to the power of 100, I'm still going to get an exponent of 97, for example. So maybe something like 20 is going to not instead. So that basically when you see the E, that means that you have a very big number and you can think of it as the part before the E times 10 to the power of whatever comes after the E. Now there are other number types that you may encounter in Julia, but less frequently. So there are the types integer eight and float 32. They use less bits, so less storage space on your computer which makes them more efficient, but they can't be as accurate because at some point there's just not that space. And there also are other number types like complex and exact rational numbers um, that you can get into if you need to. So that's a little introduction to the two main types, the two main concrete types of numbers in Julia, which are int64 and float64. Again, with the reminder that there's this abstract type of number, which includes like int64, float64, but also all these other options like int8 and float32 and um, the more complicated uh, number types. So let's look at like a few things you can do with numbers. Of course, you can do some arithmetic and in Julia, you can do all the math you ever want plus some, I think everyone can identify a point of math, which goes beyond what you could ever want to do. So you can do things like obviously addition and multiplication. And the only thing to be aware of here is the bracket placement. So this is kind of like your school math if you um, order of operations. So four times two is eight plus three is 11, or you can do three plus four is seven times two is of course 14. So in the best case, you probably want to just um, use brackets wherever you can. So you don't have to learn like exactly how Julia deals with all different order of operations. So to be safest, you, you put brackets to anything that you want to proceed. And you could also do this with brackets within brackets. So for example, we could maybe do four times two plus one plus three, or you could do four times two plus one outside <laughs> of the brackets. Basically just to show that you can use brackets to make sure that that operations happen in that order. So they happen in the order of the most, the innermost brackets and then comes the brackets that are outside those and then finally comes the things outside of brackets. 
yeah. And so you, as you know from from math, um, from math class, that does change the output. So just be aware of that when you're working with with um, numbers and Julia as well. So maybe lesser known operations. There's the the caret stands for exponentiation, which I think maybe we kind of saw. And then there's also the modulo operator. And that will see if you divide four by three, what's the remainder? So three goes into four once, and then there's a remainder of one. Um, or if we had 12 divided by three, we'd get modulo zero because three goes directly into 12 four times. But if you up to that to 14, then there's gonna be two left over when you divide by three. So that's this kind of percent sign is the modulo operator. And of course, Julia is um, loved by mathematicians or math applications because you can also use mathematical, um, I don't think I meant to say notation here. I think I meant to say like symbols. So for example, if we had this single symbol of sigma, the Greek letter sigma, which is used in, in statistics to denote like a standard deviation, we could set that equal to a value, which allows us to use the notation we would use in a mathematical formula in our code. And interestingly, you can also kind of like in a math um, expression, you could multiply that by a coefficient without having to use the multiplication operator. So if I did 2.5 sigma, then I'll get returned 7.5. So if we had x is equal to 3, 2, or, and then like 7x, it just multiplies uh, x by 7. So that allows your code to look a lot like what you would write on a piece of paper. And then finally, so um, you can also, of course, have arrays of numbers. We saw an array of strings above when I did my grocery list. So here I've made one called ages, and I've put like ages of my friends in here. So 28, 30, 24, and so on. And now I have this array called ages. And um, then I can do an array comprehension on that, just like I did on the strings. So for example, if I want to have an array of my friends' ages next year, I can make a comprehension that says age plus one for age and ages. And this could be anything. So maybe I want to say, uh, maybe I want to call this x. Then I could say x plus one for x and ages, and that's going to do the same thing. That's a variable that you can name yourself. And that's just going to go through and add one to each entry in this array and then save it as ages next year. Just another example here, we can do age times two for age and ages and make an array called double age, where then we take each individual value, multiply it by two and save it in the new array. So 30 times two is 60, 24 times two is 48 and so on. Arrays of numbers do also have some unique properties. So for example, you can take the sum of an array of numbers that will add up all of them. So if we add up the ages of my six friends, it adds up to 181. And you can also take things like the mean. For this, you need the package statistics. So if we load that package as using statistics, then we can do the mean of the ages and we'll get the average age of my friends is 30.166. Okay, so that's all um, we have to show about number types in Julia. Just a reminder that all values in Julia have a type. You don't usually have to specify it when you give a value. Um, you can, so, but you don't usually have to. Julia is generally going to know what that value is, either because it's obvious, um, like a 4.5 can't be an integer because it has a decimal, or a string is wrapped in double quote delimiters, so it, it can't be a character, for example. So it's generally going to guess um, what the type is. It's usually going to be correct. And then Julia has a system of abstract types and concrete types, where abstract types is kind of the umbrella term that contains multiple subtypes, which are the concrete types. So we showed that the abstract type is number, and the concrete types could be float um, 64, int 64, and also some other options. 
Um, and that's kind of the intro to the type system, which is going to be useful next time when we get to user defined functions and types in action. Yeah, so that's all for today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, check out our meetup page at Julia Gender Inclusive for our upcoming events and our GitHub repo for all the materials. And see you soon.